Companion Reads, Summary, Hidden Figures, The American Dream and the Untold Story of the Black Women Mathematicians Who Helped Win the Space Race. Companion Reads, Dear Readers, This is an unofficial summary and analysis of Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures, designed to enrich your reading experience. Buy the original book at http amazon.to forward slash 2L1SOXX. Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shetterly. Book Summary. In Hidden Figures, the author chronicles the real-life journey of three African-American women who played differing roles in helping to launch the first American to the moon. Melvin Butler was a man with a problem. He needed to hire several new employees to fill positions at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. The problem? It was 1943, and most men of working age were fighting in World War II. Luckily for Melvin, there were several women in the area eager to work. Two years prior, President Roosevelt had signed two executive orders to desegregate the defense industry and provide fair employment practices, which opened the door for African-American women to apply at Langley. Dorothy Vaughn, a pragmatic math whiz, began to work in the West Area Computing Office, along with Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson. Johnson and Jackson soon left the computing office to train in engineering and mathematics. While excelling in extensive courses in aerodynamics, they were still subjected to racism and sexism. However, their extreme intelligence and iron helped them to break through the barriers of racism and sexism and descend in the ranks of Langley. Each of the three women contributed in a different way to John Glenn's orbit around the Earth, especially Katherine Johnson, who Glenn implicitly trusted to double-check the trajectory of the orbit. Katherine Johnson also went on to do the calculations for the lunar rendezvous during the first American moon landing. The author interweaves American history, science, and biography to tell the story of these remarkable women who have been hidden from history for too long. Summary of Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures Book Review In her book, Hidden Figures, first-time author Margot Lee Shetterly tells the untold story of African-American women who contributed to the United States winning the space race. In the 1940s, women began to join the workforce due to the void left in the workplace by the men who were fighting in World War II. One workplace in desperate need of intelligent, hard-working people was NACA, and African-American women in particular applied in droves to land coveted jobs as computers. Some women were able to parlay entry-level jobs into engineering positions, and several ended up contributing to landing the first man on the moon. Shetterly organizes the chapters around a central theme while also following a loose chronological order. Many of the chapters also contain detailed scientific explanations. While the amount of science in the book can be overwhelming to a scientific novice, readers who persevere will be treated to an inspiring story of women who refuse to give up regardless of the doubts that society their families, and even their own selves may have had. Companion Reads Setting Timeline The setting spans from 1943 to 1969 at the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, later NASA, in Hampton, Virginia, a city caught in racial tension. The main characters traveled to Hampton from other towns in Virginia as well. During the course of the book, America progresses from World War II to the Cold War and the Soviet space race.
Summary of Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures Story Plot Analysis Shetterly ambitiously organizes each chapter around a central theme while also following a loose chronological timeline. Many of the chapter titles also have a double meaning. For example, Chapter 11 is titled The Area Rule. This title refers to both an aviation term that is explained in the chapter and the rule of segregated bathrooms at Langley that causes Mary Jackson so much embarrassment. Most of the chapters follow each other chronologically, but many chapters contain a shift in time where the author either explains previous events in the subjects' lives or previous events in history. The first several chapters of the book center around Dorothy Vaughan. Then the author discusses Catherine Goebel and Mary Jackson, interspersing their stories with scientific explanations of the women's contributions to space travel and with notable civil rights events in history, all leading up to the moon landing. Companion Reads, Main and Secondary Character List Main Characters Dorothy Vaughn, Head of the West Computing Office at Langley, Mentor to Other Women Catherine Goebel Johnson, NASA Mathematician, Double-checked the trajectory for John Glenn's orbit and performed the calculations for the Lunar Rendezvous Mary Winston Jackson, NASA Engineer tested the Apollo capsule to see if it could hold up in the supersonic speed regime. Secondary Characters Melvin Butler Personnel Officer at the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory Miriam Mann Ran numbers for the research that would allow two vehicles to dock while in space during the Apollo mission. Kazimierz Kaz Czarnecki offered Mary Jackson a position after she complained about racism and sent her on the track to becoming an engineer. John Becker, boss who challenged Mary Jackson's math on an assignment and was proven wrong. Jimmy Goebel, Catherine Goebel Johnson's first husband, died when Catherine was still young. Dorothy Hoover, mathematician who published research on airplane wings. Christine Mann Darden, worked at Langley during moon landing, went on to research sonic booms. Jim Johnson, Catherine Goebel Johnson's second husband, military officer. Asa Philip Randolph, head of the largest black labor union in America. In 1941, he was going to lead a protest with 100,000 people if the president refused to open jobs to African-American candidates. Companion Reads, Chapter Summaries, Analysis Prologue The author, Margot Lee Shetterly, and her husband were visiting her parents in Hampton, Virginia. As they drove, Shetterly's father reminded her of the women in their town who worked as computers for NASA. Her father had been a scientist at NASA in the 1960s, so Shetterly was exposed to many African-American scientists. In fact, she reflected that when she was growing up, the face of science was brown like hers. The conversation with her father brought old memories to the surface having a personal and cultural connection with the African-American women who worked for NASA in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, Shetterly decided to chronicle their stories. Chapter 1. A Door Opens In 1943, the personnel officer at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory was instructed to hire several new employees to keep up with President Roosevelt's demand for a massive increase in plane production. Since so many men were fighting in World War II at this time, the company opened hiring to women 
including African-American women who were included under two executive orders signed by Roosevelt in 1941. Many qualified African-American women applied for the jobs in order to gain financial security and prestige for their families. Chapter 2. Mobilization Dorothy Vaughn was a college-educated African-American math teacher who was working in an army laundry room for the summer. Beautiful, petite, and independent, this mother of four was also confident and extremely intelligent. She had the chance to attend graduate school, but declined in order to help her family financially. Vaughn saw an advertisement for a job at Langley and applied. Chapter 3, Past, is Prologue. Although Vaughn was a highly respected educator who was firmly entrenched in her adopted town of Farmville, she accepted a job as mathematician under a wartime contract and prepared to move to Newport News, Virginia. She had small misgivings about leaving her children, but knew that they were surrounded by a large group of caregivers. However, she had greater misgivings about leaving her husband, since their marriage was already strained due to her husband's work travel and their different interests. Despite these concerns, she said goodbye to her family and headed to Newport News. Chapter 4. The Double V Vaughn arrived in Newport News, a city dedicated to the business of war. She rented a room from an African-American couple in the east end of Newport News. The city was overcrowded, and its exhausted citizens were subjected to racial tension, an overload of work, and a dearth of daily pleasures such as butter and meat due to war rations. Many African Americans felt a struggle between patriotism and being treated horribly by the country they were fighting for. Chapter 5 Manifest Destiny Vaughn was assigned to the west area of Langley, which was where the African American women worked. A month before Vaughn arrived, the secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, had visited Langley. All the workers, men and women, African American and white, had gathered together to listen to his speech. Ironically, after this inclusive speech, the African American women had gone to the cafeteria and had sat at their usual table labeled colored computers. The women had always tried to ignore the sign and its broader implications. But one day, Miriam Mann decided that she had had enough. She began a daily ritual of stealing the sign and putting it in her purse. After a while, the colored computer sign did not return, and the women were able to eat their lunches with dignity. Chapter 6 Warbirds the Tuskegee Airmen took the African-American community by storm, bringing the community pride and hope for equality. Langley workers infiltrated the town of Hampton, confusing and frustrating the locals with their perceived strangeness. Vaughn and the other new computers began courses in engineering physics and learned about aerodynamics and wind tunnels. Vaughn immersed herself in her studies. Chapter 7. The Duration Tired of making the long trip between her job in Newport News and her family in Farmville, Vaughn decided to move permanently to Newport News and to bring her children with her. They settled in an apartment in an African-American area called Newsom Park. Her husband, Howard, visited sporadically, but their lives remained wholly separate. The joy of World War II ending was marred by the layoffs of two million American women. 
African-American workers, especially African-American women, feared that they would lose the tenuous respect that they had earned in the workplace. Vaughn and her children became enmeshed in life in Newsom Park, with Vaughn hoping that her wartime contract would be made permanent. Chapter 8. Those Who Move Forward After four years staying at home with her children, Catherine Goebel returned to the classroom to take over her ailing husband's contract. When Goebel was growing up, she had shown that she had her father's intelligence and love of math. Her father moved the family so that the children could continue to be educated. Goebel attended West Virginia State College and was mentored by Dr. William Claytor, who prepared her for a career as a research mathematician. After college, Goebel was working as a teacher when she was chosen to be one of three African-American students to integrate West Virginia University. She began her graduate program, but soon learned that she and her husband were expecting a baby. She stopped her studies to focus on raising a family. Chapter 9 Breaking Barriers Despite not seeing each other often, Vaughn and her husband had two more children. After spending time with each child, Vaughn returned to work. Her family depended on her income, and she had a large network of caregivers for her children. Although she was making more money than she had ever made, she was still conscious of how easily that money could be taken away. She wore old clothing and ate her children's leftovers to make sure that the children had everything they needed. Vaughn was made a permanent employee in 1946. Many women around the country were working in the field of aerodynamics. However, it was much more difficult for them to advance in their careers than it was for men to do so. Despite this, many women managed to have successful careers at Langley. After Vaughn's immediate supervisor died, Vaughn was appointed the acting head of West Computing, eventually becoming head of West Computing. Chapter 10 Home by the Sea Mary Winston Jackson grew up in Hampton and attended the Hampton Institute where she double majored in mathematics and physical science. Like many of her family members, she became a teacher. Jackson worked for one year in Maryland, but moved back home to Hampton to take care of her ill father. Unable to get a teaching job due to her family members working for the school system, she became the secretary and bookkeeper for the King Street USO. She excelled at her job, frequently performing many duties outside of her assigned position. After Jackson started a family, she became the leader of a Girl Scout troop. She poured all of her energy and resources into making sure that the girls in her troop were exposed to different ways of life. In 1951, she began working as a clerk typist at Fort Monroe, which required her to have secret security clearance. Russia and America's aeronautical competition opened more jobs at Langley, and Jackson took a job working for Dorothy Vaughn as a NACA computer. NACA began working to make supersonic flight a reality. Meanwhile, the tension surrounding the Rosenberg trial put the country on edge, painting everyone in a suspicious light. America's racial problems became the cause of international embarrassment, and President Truman issued Executive Order 9980, which held federal department heads responsible for ending workplace discrimination. Chapter 11 The Area Rule Dorothy Vaughn sent Mary Jackson to the east side to work along several white computers. When Jackson asked for directions to the bathroom, 
the white computers laughed because they did not know where Jackson should use the restroom, since restrooms were segregated. Jackson carried the anger and humiliation of that moment with her for the rest of the day and was still angry when she later saw Kazmira's Kaz Zarnecki. After she vented to him, Zarnecki offered her a job, which she gladly accepted. The Langley Laboratory advanced American aerodynamics with work on wind tunnels and the area rule. Dorothy Hoover, an African-American theoretical engineer at Langley, published two notable reports with male scientists about swept-back wings. Hoover later resigned from engineering to attend graduate school and earn a master's degree in mathematics. Meanwhile, Mary Jackson thrived at her job as an engineer. Jackson was given an assignment by one of her superiors named John Becker. She completed the assignment. Becker challenged her calculations. Jackson insisted she was correct. And the fault turned out to be Becker's. Her talent and ability to stand up for herself marked her as someone who should be promoted. Chapter 12 Serendipity. During a family wedding, teacher Catherine Goebel was offered a job at Langley. She began working under Dorothy Vaughn, but was quickly reassigned to the Flight Research Division. On her first day in her new office, Goebel sat next to a white male engineer, but he moved away quickly. She was not sure if he had moved because she was African American, a female, or a lower position than he but she decided to be prudent and not pursue the issue. Within two weeks, she won him over and they became friends. Chapter 13. Turbulence Dorothy Vaughn negotiated a promotion and a raise for Catherine Goebel, who was given a permanent position in the Flight Research Division. Goebel's mathematical abilities, combined with her desire to learn, helped her fit in well in a testosterone-driven department. Goebel refused to use the segregated bathroom and did not eat in the lunchroom in order to avoid any racial conflict. When her husband Jimmy passed away from a brain tumor, Goebel was devastated but insisted that her daughters continue to work hard and succeed in school so they could have a good future. Chapter 14. Angle of Attack Langley began using electronic computers. Even though the human computers still had their jobs, Dorothy Vaughn sensed that learning to use the electronic computers was important for job security and enrolled in computing courses. In Vaughn's hometown of Farmville, the African-American students were riding in dangerously old school buses. One of the buses crashed and killed Barbara Johns's best friend. Barbara Johns gathered other students from her high school to protest for the same safety and education as the white students received at their high school. The protest caught the eye of two Virginia lawyers who worked with Thurgood Marshall. Marshall gathered Johns's protest along with several similar suits across the country to form the U.S. Supreme Court case Brown versus the Board of Education, which led to the integration of all schools in the United States. The state of Virginia resisted following the order to integrate. Kaz Zarnecki put Mary Jackson to work in the wind tunnels before asking her to begin training to be an engineer. Because of the state of Virginia's segregation policy, she had to receive dispensation to attend engineering training at a whites-only school. Black, male engineers struggled at Langley when having to work with white, blue-collar workers. Chapter 15. Young, Gifted, and Black 
Christine Mann attended boarding school in North Carolina. As she was arranging the library's newspapers and magazines, she read about Sputnik. African-American newspapers were blaming the missile gap on school segregation. Since Russia did not segregate schools, the newspaper reporters surmised. Russia had the benefit of having access to every brilliant mind in the country, not just brilliant white minds. As she read about Sputnik, Mann felt that she wanted to be involved in the space fight with Russia. Mann had enjoyed an upbringing filled with learning. After graduating from her boarding school, she decided to attend Hampton Institute. Chapter 16. What a Difference a Day Makes In 1957, the United States was still trailing Russia in the space race. Langley began to shift its focus from aeronautics to space travel. The African-American employees at Langley slowly became more accepted by the white employees as the civil rights movement gathered steam. The government changed NACA, which had focused on aeronautics, into NASA, which would focus on space travel. On May 5, 1958, the West Area Computers Unit was disbanded, which marked the ending of segregation at Langley. Chapter 17 Outer Space Catherine Goebel and her colleagues began intensively researching space travel. Goebel asked to attend editorial meetings with her male co-workers and was told that she could not because she was a woman, but because of her intelligence and persistence, they eventually allowed her to attend. Chapter 18 With All Deliberate Speed in 1958, NASA's Space Task Group began working on Project Mercury with the goal of sending a man into space. In the same year, Virginia closed the public schools that had integrated, leaving thousands of students without education. Catherine Goebel met Army Captain Jim Johnson at church, and they began dating. The NASA engineers worked tirelessly on Project Mercury. Goebel was put in charge of the trajectory of the rocket. She was the first female from Langley's Aerospace Mechanics Division to author a report. Catherine Goebel married Jim Johnson in 1959. Chapter 19 Model Behavior Mary Jackson and her son Levi immersed themselves in building the perfect car for the 1960 Soapbox Derby. Even though it was usually fathers who helped build the derby cars, and it was very unusual for African-American boys to enter the race, Jackson did not let either of those obstacles deter her. Jackson put this same determination to work to help African-American employees at Langley and to reach out to African-American schoolgirls and Girl Scouts. Jackson was thrilled when her son won the Soapbox Derby, not only because of the victory and the prizes that went with it, but because he was the first African-American to win. She knew that this win meant that another obstacle for African-American equality had been overcome. Chapter 20 Degrees of Freedom in 1960, college students in North Carolina began protesting racial inequality with sit-ins. The sit-ins spread to Hampton Institute, where Christine Mann began participating. She also helped with voter registration drives to encourage African-American voters to register so they could vote for John F. Kennedy. Langley had integrated its employees and was accepting more men into the computing field. Concerned that this may lead to the end of her job, Dorothy Vaughn began learning how to be a computer programmer. 
the engineers at Langley continued working on Project Mercury. In 1961, a Russian cosmonaut became the first person in space, while simultaneously becoming the first person to orbit the Earth. This encouraged NASA to work even harder on Project Mercury. Alan Shepard became the first American astronaut in space. A few weeks after the first American space flight, President Kennedy declared that the United States should focus on traveling to the moon. NASA moved its headquarters to Houston to better prepare for a moon landing. Chapter 21 Out of the Past, the Future Katherine Johnson, formerly Katherine Goebel, and the rest of the NASA engineers and mathematicians worked tirelessly to calculate the safest way for John Glenn to be the first American to complete an orbital flight. Numerous complications pushed back Glenn's spaceflight. Through it all, the NASA employees kept working, and Glenn continued training so he would be ready when they told him it was time. While the American spaceflight was delayed, a Russian cosmonaut spent almost a full day in space, which made the American government anxious and worried that America was falling behind in the space race. Glenn didn't trust the electronic computers to calculate the numbers that would keep him safe, but he did trust Katherine Johnson, and he requested that she double-check the electronic computer's numbers to make sure the trajectory was correct. Many of the former West computers had roles in Glenn's space flight as well. Dorothy Vaughn had helped with Project Scout, a solid-fuel rocket that was tested before Project Mercury. Miriam Mann calculated the numbers that would permit two vehicles to dock while in space. Mary Jackson tested the Apollo capsule to see if it could hold up to supersonic speed. Despite a few complications, Glenn's spaceflight was successful. Glenn became an American hero, but Johnson became a hero to the African-American community for her pivotal role in the space flight. Chapter 22 America is for Everybody On August 28, 1963, the March for Jobs and Freedom was held in Washington, D.C., to bring attention to racial inequality in America. During this march, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. That year also marked Dorothy Vaughn's 20th year at Langley. Even though Langley was integrated, the town where it was located was still segregated, which meant that not many African-American employees were applying to work there. Langley began recruiting at prestigious African-American colleges in an effort to hire more talented workers. Christine Mann Darden began working at Langley in the physics re-entry branch, where she was embraced by Katherine Johnson. In 1967, Apollo 1 caught fire and killed three astronauts. The NASA employees continued to work relentlessly on the moon landing. Chapter 23 To Boldly Go In the summer of 1969, Apollo 11 was the first manned spaceflight to land on the moon. Although it was an exciting time for America, some African Americans were angry that there was so much money being spent on space travel when so many African Americans were destitute. Even African Americans who worked at NASA sometimes felt overlooked. However, in 1966, Star Trek premiered with an African-American actress playing a main role. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. felt that the character of Uhura was a symbol of equality. The successful moon landing made Katherine Johnson feel that anything could be possible.
Companion Reads, Epilogue After the first moon landing, Katherine Johnson continued contributing to the space program. Even though she was NASA's most recognized African-American female employee from the 1950s and 1960s, she never hesitated to applaud her other colleagues for their intelligence and hard work. In the 1970s, Langley went through a massive reorganization and laid off hundreds of people as the goals of NASA began to change from outer space travel to more pedestrian pursuits. Mary Jackson continued to work for NASA and to lead outreach programs to raise high school students' interest in science. Frustrated with her prospects of advancement in the engineering field, in 1979, Jackson switched positions and became the federal women's program manager. Gloria Champagne was a white woman who was the first female technical assistant to the Division Chief of Space Systems. She worked with Mary Jackson and helped Christine Darden advance her career. Christine Darden was slated to be laid off when she met with John Becker. Instead of being laid off, she was reassigned to work on sonic boom research, where she wrote code to minimize sonic booms. She earned a doctorate in mechanical engineering, and Gloria Champagne helped her get promoted to a GS-14 level. Dorothy Vaughn retired in 1971, having paved the way for and shaped the careers of many women working at Langley. Companion Reads Analysis of Key Characters Dorothy Vaughn Dorothy Vaughn was an African-American college graduate from a hard-working family. She taught math during the school year and worked in a laundry during the summer until she applied to work at Langley. Even though she had to leave her children and husband behind to take the job, she was independent, ambitious, and intelligent, and knew that she could provide better for her family by taking a job farther away than she could by remaining with them. She believed strongly in the importance of education and made sure to pass that belief on to her children. After her children moved to Newport News to be with her, she would only eat their leftovers to make sure that they had enough to eat. She became the first African-American manager of computers at Langley. Catherine Goble Johnson Catherine Goble Johnson was highly intelligent and studied mathematics in college. She was a math teacher and a stay-at-home mother before she went to work at Langley under Dorothy Vaughan. Due to her intelligence and perseverance, she quickly ascended the ranks. After her first husband died, she held her family together and made sure that her children still exceeded the high expectations she had placed on them. She asked so many times to be included in the all-male editorial meetings at Langley that the men finally let her join. Although she was aware of discrimination when she was in the workplace, she acted as though racism and sexism did not exist, and she was able to command the respect of her colleagues because of the excellent quality of her work. Her work was so excellent that John Glenn chose her to calculate the trajectory of his orbital flight. Mary Jackson Mary Jackson trained as a teacher and worked as a secretary and bookkeeper for the USO. She was known for doing whatever anyone needed. When John Becker gave her an assignment and challenged her numbers, she publicly disagreed with him and was proven correct. She bravely put aside her pride to apply for special dispensation to attend a whites-only school so she could study engineering. She was also a tireless scout leader who made sure that young African-American women were exposed to a different sort of life than they had previously experienced. After a successful career as an engineer, Jackson became the Federal Women's Program Manager at Langley so she could help all women advance their careers. Major Symbols The Colored Girl's Sign in the Cafeteria 
the colored girl sign in the cafeteria is a symbol of discrimination against the African-American women who worked at Langley. When Miriam Mann kept stealing the sign, she was showing that the women were demanding equality in the workplace. The sign finally not being replaced symbolizes Langley's growing acceptance of African-Americans. Soapbox Derby The Soapbox Derby is a symbol of opportunity. Previously, only white children entered the derby. This mirrors how only white people in America had the opportunity to succeed and make a good life for themselves and their families. Mary Jackson's son not only entering but winning the derby shows that opportunity is no longer just for white Americans, but for all Americans. Acronym Guide ESMWT Engineering, Science, and Management War Training Programs offered at Hampton Institute that were meant to help African-American employees find better jobs. FEPC, Fair Employment Practices Committee, committee during World War II that tried to ensure that all people had an equal chance of getting hired for jobs. Fort Tron, Formula Translation Language the programming language that told the computers how to process the equations. NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The precursor to NASA, which focused on aviation. NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the name given to the combination of NACA with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and all other areas of the U.S. government working on space travel. PARD Pilotless Aircraft Research Division Studied the aerodynamics of rockets and missiles. RIF RIG Reduction in Force Reduction in Grade In 1970, Langley laid off hundreds in a reorganization that people referred to as riffing. SST, Supersonic Transport Program, canceled in 1972 after complaints about property damage and damage to animals from shockwaves. USO, United Service Organization, Mary Jackson worked at USO before starting at Langley. Walk, Women's Army Corps. Dorothy Vaughn sees them her first day in Newport News. Attention, my free gift to you. As a way to say thank you for being a fan of our series, I've included a free gift for you. Get How to Learn More Effectively, for you, free. If you'd like one, please visit www.companionreads.com forward slash gift. Motifs Double V the double V stands for two kinds of victory, victory from outside enemies and victory from inside enemies. Outside enemies are enemies of the United States, such as Germany in World War II and Russia in the Cold War. Inside enemies are United States citizens who discriminate against African Americans. This idea appears many times in the book, whenever the subjects are facing hardships in their jobs or their lives. It is an idea that gives them strength and reminds them to persevere so they can have victory. What are we fighting for? The phrase, what are we fighting for, occurs many times in the book. African American soldiers would bravely fight for America in World War II and then come back to America and be treated horribly. This treatment made some of them wonder why they would fight for a country that
that seemed to hate them. Thank you. Hope you've enjoyed your reading experience. We here at Companion Reads will always strive to deliver to you the highest quality guides. So, I'd like to thank you for supporting us and reading until the very end. Before you go, would you mind leaving us a review on Amazon? It will mean a lot to us and support us creating high-quality guides for you in the future. Thanks once again, and leave your review at bit.ly forward slash shf review. Warmly yours, the Companion Reads team. Themes. Perseverance. Throughout the book, the different subjects persevere in order to meet their goals. Whether it is Mary Jackson attending engineering training at a whites-only school, or Katherine Johnson lobbying to be included in male-only engineering meetings, all of the characters have to fight for what they want. Their perseverance is rewarded by notable careers and personal achievement. Race Relations. The author discusses race relations many times in the book. Some of the African-American subjects, like Katherine Johnson, do not seem to struggle outwardly with race. Other subjects, such as the African-American soldiers who fight in World War II, are disgusted over the treatment of minorities, but feel beaten by the discrimination. Still, others, such as Asa Philippe Rudolph, channel their frustrations into ensuring that people of all races have the same opportunities. Discrimination. Many subjects in the book encounter discrimination. The state of Virginia discriminates against African-American students by refusing to integrate schools. Langley practices a sort of passive discrimination by labeling bathrooms and lunch tables, but not enforcing the labels. Mary Jackson is discriminated against by the women in East Computing who laugh at her for asking where the bathroom is. The African-American male engineers are discriminated against by the blue-collar white workers. It is important to note that the majority of the subjects who experience discrimination do not let it deter them from their goals. Feminism Feminism is a main theme of this book. Mary Jackson and Katherine Johnson both worked in fields that were male-dominated in a time when women were truly not encouraged or expected to break into these fields. Their brilliance and bravery paved the way for so many women who came behind them. Thought-Provoking Discussion Questions Discuss the double meanings behind each chapter title. Discuss the organization of the book. Was the timeline easy for you to follow? Why or why not? If not, what could have made the book easier to follow? Discuss Shetterly's motivation for writing this book. Are there any interesting stories from your hometown that you would like to know more about? Is the subject matter of this book too lofty for a first-time author? Did you enjoy the book? If so, which parts did you like best? If not, what made you not enjoy it? The book is very science-heavy. In your opinion, do the scientific explanations take away from the story of the women? Discuss the title of the book. Can you think of an alternative title that may have fit the book better? <laughs>